Hi, I'm Nikki Gold, and I'll be hosting the next episode of Over My Dead Body from the Cypress Hills National Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. We'll be talking to screen legend Mae West, who will share with us some highlights from her amazing life. My life is still amazing. Would you mind turning that switch on for me, dearie? This one? Yes. Thank you. That's much better. Oh. Well, what did I just do? Oh, yeah. Well, what's this connected to? I'll tell you later. Just give me a minute. Mae West. Oh. Up close and oh. very personal. Oh. Coming up. Oh, yeah. Hello, I'm Nikki Gold. Welcome to a very special episode of Over My Dead Body, the only talk show that brings to life the most interesting and compelling people from our history and culture. Today we've traveled to Brooklyn, New York, and more specifically to the Cypress Hills National Cemetery, where our amazing guest is now residing. I'm talking about the one and only Mae West, who has agreed to be interviewed for the first time since her death in 1980. Come on. Let's see what's on her mind. I'd like to welcome you to the show. What a pleasure it is to have you here, Miss West. Speak for yourself, honey. I wouldn't go so far as to call being here pleasure, and I know pleasure. Of course. There are a lot of young people watching this show with no idea who you are. Which is hard to believe since the American Film Institute has you ranked at number 15 on their list of greatest legends of all time. Plus, you've always been one of my idols. Trust me, they'll know who I am 20 minutes from now. Would you mind telling our viewers a little about your childhood, your family, growing up? I suppose we should get that out of the way before we get to the meat of the matter. I'm a Brooklyn girl. My father started out as a prize fighter, which may be why I like sleeping with boxes and not briefs. My mom was a corset and fashion model. I also had a sister and a brother, both of whom wanted to be me. Sibling rivalry? It wasn't much of a fight. Were you always drawn to show business? I craved attention like any child and figured out how to get it at an early age. First it derived from my looks, but very soon it became a matter of what I had to say, which I much preferred. According to Wikipedia, your first performance was at age five at a church social. And at seven, you won local talent contests. If you've got it, flaunt it. In 1911, at the age of 18, you got a bit part in a Broadway show called A La Broadway, which folded after only eight performances. But the New York Times gave you a favorable review. As they should have. It got me my next show, Via Violetta with Al Jolson, and a number of other shows. Until 1918, when the Schubert brothers cast me in a musical with Ed Wynn. And I got to shimmy. You popularized the shimmy? I did my best. But to be honest, Nikki, these were bit parts going nowhere. So in 1926, I decided to write and produce my own plays from that point on because I couldn't get arrested when it came to landing a decent role on stage. According to the press, the first play you wrote was called Sex, and the authorities raided the theater, arrested you along with the other cast members, and prosecuted you guys on moral charges. I finally got arrested on Broadway. It was my dream come true. Did you go to jail? I have the option to pay a $500 fine or serve 10 days in jail. And I chose jail because I knew the publicity would be good for ticket sales. Not much has changed in 90 years. The warden called me into his office and we had dinner together. Then he gave me two days off for good behavior. Ten minutes for two days. I like the math involved in that. It says you were charged with corrupting the morals of youth. I never corrupted anyone's morals. I may have interrupted them at times. What got you into Hollywood and into the movies? I wrote a play in 1928 called Diamond Lil. That was a big hit. It became my persona for the rest of my life. 
Paramount Pictures offered you a movie contract despite your being 39 years old, where you essentially played the Diamond Lil character, a sexually secure, intelligent, liberated woman. It wasn't acting. I was just being myself. I lost my virginity at 13 and had sex at least once a day for the rest of my life. I've always believed that an orgasm a day keeps a doctor away, or at bay, if you're in bed with a doctor. Can you tell our viewers a little about your movie career? I was in Night After Night in 1932 with John Draft. They let me rewrite my own scenes. So when the hat check girl said, goodness, what beautiful diamonds, I replied, goodness had nothing to do with it, dearie. That became my second most famous line after, oh, why don't you come up and see me sometime? And your next movie literally saved Paramount from bankruptcy. It was called, She Done Em Wrong. I pretty much took my Diamond Lil character and renamed her Lady Lou. Then I saw Cary Grant in the parking lot, got him the lead, and the film grossed over $2 million, the equivalent of $140 million today. That's when they named a building on the lot after me. After that, there was I'm No Angel. And in 1933, you were the largest box office draw as well as the highest paid woman in the country. Only one person in America made more money than me at the time, and that was William Randolph Hearst, who wanted to marry me. If I could assure him I'd remain faithful, I said, give me 30 minutes to think it over, and then went off and slept with his chef. But technically you were already married. If you could call it that, I'd kept that a secret for years. I got married at 18 to a guy named Frank something. Frank Wallace. Sounds familiar. I don't even remember why I did it. But after two weeks of being a wife, I would go out at night for hours at a time. So I guess you could say marriage wasn't the institution for me. How long did you stay married? Until 1943. That's 32 very happy years. Of course, we only lived together a few weeks. Did you have fun in Hollywood? I stayed in the same apartment for 48 years. If those walls could talk. Did you bring many lovers there? Honey, let's just say if you wrote their names on the wall, it would put the Vietnam Memorial to shame. I read that every room in your home was covered in mirrors, including the ceiling. I like to see where I'm going and where I've been. The late movie critic Roger Ebert wrote that you were the first woman to write and star in your own movies. That's correct. I appeared in 13 movies, wrote nine of them myself, and rewrote the other four. Eventually, I was banned from movies, then TV, and even radio. So I went back to the stage and performed in nightclubs. Did all that controversy bother you? What got me into the entertainment business was pushing the envelope. And it also landed me in hot water from time to time. Had I played it safe, I'd never have gotten anywhere in the first place. So no, it wasn't much of a bother. In this biography by George Ells and Stanley Musgrove, it says in 1937 you were put on a list of actors called Box Office Poison, along with Greta Garbo, Joan Crawford, Marlena Dietrich, Fred Astaire, Dolores Del Rio, Katherine Hepburn, and Kay Francis. Everybody on that list was an independent woman, including Fred Astaire. And this frightened people, but David O'Selznick offered me a part in Gone with the Wind anyway. As Scarlett O'Hara? No, as a madam, Val Watling, the only woman to truly understand Rhett Butler. This was after Tallulah Bankhead turned down the role. And you didn't take it? I said, Mr. Selznick, I don't want Tallulah's sloppy seconds. And while all this was going on, you uttered your third most famous line. Is that a gun in your pocket? Or are you just happy to see me? Like many people, I've always admired your one-liners. I think we all have our favorite. And what's your favorite, Nikki? I feel like a million tonight, but one at a time. It's not the men in your life that matters. It's the life in your men. I used to be Snow White, but I drifted. I only like two kinds of men, domestic and imported. I've been in more laughs than a napkin. 
When I'm good, I'm very good. When I'm bad, I'm better. Miss West, what's your favorite line? A man's kiss is his signature. That's beautiful. I could order a cup of coffee and people would search for a double meaning. Did you really turn down the Beatles when they wanted your picture on their album cover? They wanted to put my picture on an album called Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. I told them I wanted nothing to do with a Lonely Hearts Club. But they wrote me a nice note and all of them signed it, so I changed my mind. In 1959, you published your autobiography, Goodness Had Nothing to Do With It, which became an instant bestseller. That got me back into television until CBS kicked me off the air for putting a nude statue of myself on the piano. Five years later, I made a comeback in an episode of Mr. Red. I think the producers cast me because I once played Catherine the Great. Was that fun? Mr. Ed was the only leading man I didn't sleep with, although I thought about it. He had everything you'd want in a leading man. He was witty, funny, and hung like a horse. I understand there have been some very notable men in your life. They're notable, Nikki, because I made notes after being with them. I've always said if a woman keeps a diary, it will someday keep her. We have Liz Berman from Park City, Utah on the line. Hello, Liz. Hi, Miss West. Can you tell me who your favorite leading man you've ever worked with and why? And who are some of your favorite female stars today? Aside from Mr. Ed, George Raft was my favorite. We worked together on my first film and my last. George didn't mind me stealing every scene. He said it was like watching a cat burglar at work. And yes, of course I slept with him. Female stars today? I like Julia Roberts for her role in Aaron Brockovich. And I think Reese Witherspoon is kind of cute. But if you're looking for a hot woman on screen, just watch one of my old movies. I understand that you met Marilyn Monroe at a dinner party and made her blush in front of the guests. She was married to Joe DiMaggio at the time, and I said to her, Honey, the only difference between us is that you settle for one ball player, and I prefer the whole team. When you first moved to Hollywood, you began dating an African-American boxer named William Jones. He wasn't African-American then. He was black and went by the nickname Gorilla Jones. He could pummel his opponents to pieces. Did you guys live together? For a while, we did. In fact, the landlord at Ravenswood, that was the name of my building, refused to let him stay overnight because of his race. So I bought the building and evicted the landlord. What became of Mr. Jones? He wanted to get married. I let him know he was a good boxer, but not good enough for that fight. Sean Rosette Senning from Richmond, Virginia, say hello to the incomparable Mae West. Miss West, I just want to say you are everything a woman should stand for, and I don't know where the world would be without you. Thank you, Sean. That's quite a grandiose compliment, but I'll accept it. I've been married since February 5th, 1984. That's 12,285 days. Have you been faithful the entire time? Yes. I'm so sorry. I've grown into an irritable wife and mother. I was wondering if you could recommend something, anything to take the edge off, like volume? No medication is necessary. What you need, and I can't emphasize this enough, is a battery-operated S. MP. Huh? That stands for Sexual Maintenance Partner. It's a very personal digital assistant. Really? You'll have the town buzzing. Everybody around you will benefit. But most of all, Sean, you will benefit. Would your advice have anything to do with this basket of AA batteries? I have the most loyal and adorable fans. They leave batteries when they visit because they know how fast I go through them. Need I say more? I think we understand. In 1970, you told Dick Cavett that you purposely put racy lines into your scripts so the censors would have something to take out, and so the less racy ones would seem tame by comparison. That way, I could keep some of my lines in the movie. Did you enjoy your interview with Dick Cavett? God, no. He reminded me of an English schoolboy who just discovered his pee-pee, but had no idea what to do with it. All he did was giggle the entire time. 
How we get to Yale is a mystery. Miss West, we have Naomi Norton on the line from Ohio, California. Thank you for taking my call. I've seen all your movies and read a lot about you. And I want to know, what's the most romantic thing a man has ever said to you? John Wayne once walked over to my table in a restaurant and said, My face leaves in 30 minutes. Be on it. Things like that must have made your boyfriends jealous. They were all jealous. But let me tell you, Nikki, I had one in particular named James Timoney. He was also my manager for many years. And in 1948, when we were on the road doing a revival of Diamond Lil, his hotel room was directly across the hall from mine. You stayed in separate rooms. It was the respectable thing to do in those days. Jim would just stare through the keyhole to see if anybody entered my room. So I made it a point to go to Jim's room before retiring for the night. And while I was there, my man of the hour would let himself into my room with the extra key I'd given him earlier. Did you ever get caught? No, but during the play's run, I snagged a high heel in the carpet and broke my ankle. The doctor said I'd be on my back for three months, but I wasn't too worried. I hired a male nurse from London to care for me. And my manager couldn't understand why every time he walked past my room, I'd be yelling, the British are coming. Troy Nelson from Philadelphia has a question for Mae West. Hi, Miss West. It's an absolute honor. I realize that. What can I do for you, Troy? I have a photo of you in a light blue dress that I've been jacking off to for years, and I just wanted to thank you. My question is, how do you keep your skin so silky and shiny? I mean, do you let your partner come on your face? That's disgusting, Troy. If you want to know my little trade secret, I have given myself enemas every morning for decades. They keep my skin smooth and I smell sweet from both ends. I'll also take an enema before filming a close-up. How does it work? There's a tube behind the table which attaches to a plastic container filled with saline solution. It puts my colon in quite a tizzy. This makes your skin smooth and silky. It's a miracle. I don't know what I'd do without it. As a matter of fact, I was going to ask you if you would be so kind as to squeeze the plastic container because I don't know when one of my fans will stop by next. Absolutely. But not yet, honey. Wait until the interview is over. Otherwise, there will be quite a mess in about three minutes. So, are you working on anything now? just the book about my past lovers. You wouldn't. It's called The Long and Short of It. That's the working title. And it features Frank Wallace and Paul Novak and Steve Rossi and Jack LaRue and Gary Cooper and Max Baer and George Raft and Victor McLaughlin and Anthony Quinn and David Niven and Bugsy Siegel and Joe Lewis and Steve Cochran, and Duke Ellington, and Abel Bear, and Liberace, to name a few. I thought Liberace was gay. He was when I got done with him. Tell me about Paul Novak. He was darling. There was a slight age difference. We met when I was 62, and he was 32. And then lived together for 26 years. I died in his arms many times. He was with me to the end. Wasn't he a former Mr. California? Yes. Then he was a muscle man in the chorus. Paul Novak was the love of my life. May, we have a teenage girl on the line, Catherine Sheehan from Melbourne, Australia. Hi, Miss West. What can I do for you, my dear? I didn't get any attention from the boys at my school, and no one wanted to take me to the prom. Until I saw you in a movie and decided to be you, to act like you and dress like you, and now the boys won't leave me alone. Enjoy it. Anyway, I was wondering if you had a daughter, what advice would you give her? The same as I'll give you. Always demand to be treated with respect as a lady, no matter what you may have done the night before. And use condoms. Also, would you ever consider running for office? I don't think I could handle any more public scrutiny. Attention is one thing. Being under a microscope is quite another. Well, it sure seems that America could use your help right now. I do think sex in the White House is a vital part of good government. 
Just look how well things were going while Jack Kennedy and Bill Clinton were in office. Come to think of it, maybe I will declare my candidacy. 67 years after your stage debut and after a 27-year absence from movies, along came Myra Breckenridge. That movie turned out to be my swan song. It put me right back on the map. What do you think of the entertainment industry today versus when you're working for, say, Paramount? I get tired of seeing all the CGI stuff and green screen effects in most films today. I'm an organic kind of gal. In my day, what you saw is what you got. What do you think women today are looking for? The same thing as always. And another thing, what's so great about that book and movie Fifty Shades of Grey? That's nothing. Try doing all 245 positions of the Kama Sutra. That'll get your heart pumping. That's a good point. But you weren't dependent on a man. I was dependent on many men, usually at 2 a.m., and at other times as well. There have been many Mae West impersonators over the years. Even today, Gigmasters has a list of almost 100. They do, indeed. Jim Bailey was my favorite. But today, Craig Russell and RuPaul do a pretty good job. I saw an interview on TV recently with Bette Midler, who says on her very first appearance with Johnny Carson, she did an imitation of you and thought you'd love it. Instead, you sent a cease and desist letter. It's disheartening when a man can portray me better than a woman. Let's just say, Bette Midler wasn't the wind beneath my wings. You've appeared on a number of talk shows over the years. I'm curious to know if you've been asked to do any lately. Not a day goes by without my agent getting a talk show request. Last month, Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon, I call them the two Jiminies, wanted me as a guest. And Conan, the latent homosexual, has asked me to appear on his show many times. And just this morning, I received an invitation from The View. Do you watch The View? Only when I tune in by mistake. Who wants to be on a show with a bunch of gossiping middle-aged ladies? I've got better things to do. You have a point. Now, being on The Bachelorette would be much better. By the time I got done with all those men, the show would have lasted eight seasons. Well, we're very flattered that you chose our show. It's been a pleasure, Nikki. I feel I can let my guard down with you. That's so sweet. Who is the real Mae West? You're talking to her. Being me isn't for everyone, but it provided my family and I with an exciting and full life. Do you have any regrets? Is there anything in your life that you do differently? I've always said, you only live once. But if you do it right, once is enough. But it would have been nice to live in the age of, say... The internet? I was thinking more of Viagra. You sure you didn't squeeze that enema? It's such an honor to be here with you. Do you have any final thoughts for our viewers? I was the first truly liberated woman in America. No man was going to get the best of me. That's what I wrote all my scripts about. This has been so much fun. I'm really going to miss you. Come back and see me sometime. Thank you, Mae West. And thank all of you for joining me here at the Cypress Hills National Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. We'll see you again soon on the next episode of Over My Dead Body.